Homeless by Anna Quindlin from the New York Times. Her name is Anne, and we met in the Port Authority bus terminal several Januarys ago. I was doing a story on homeless people. She said I was wasting my time talking to her. She was just passing through, although she'd been passing through for more than two weeks. To prove to me that this was true, she rummaged through a tote bag and a manila envelope and finally unfolded a sheet of typing paper and brought out her photographs. They were not pictures of family or friends or even a dog or cat. Its eyes brown red in the flashbulb's light. They were pictures of a house. It was like a thousand houses in a hundred towns. Not suburb, not city, but somewhere in between, with aluminum siding and a chain-link fence, a narrow driveway running up to a one-car garage and a patch of backyard. The house was yellow. I looked on the back for a date or a name, but neither was there. There was no need for discussion. I knew what she was trying to tell me, for it was something I had often felt. She was not adrift, alone, anonymous, although her bags and her raincoat with the grime shadowing its creases made me believe she was. She had a house, or at least once upon a time had had one. Inside were curtains, a couch, a stove, potholders. You are where you live. She was somebody. In other words, the author tells about a homeless woman she met. Because the woman has a picture of a house she once lived in, she does not consider herself homeless. The author connects having a place to live with a person's feeling that he or she is someone who matters. I've never been very good at looking at the big picture, taking the global view, and I've always been a person with an overactive sense of place, the legacy of an Irish grandfather. So it is natural that the thing that seems most wrong with the world to me right now is that there are so many people with no homes. I'm not simply talking about shelter from the elements or three square meals a day or a mailing address to which the welfare people can send the check, although I know that all these are important for survival. I'm talking about a home, about precisely those kinds of feelings that have wound up in cross-stitch and French knots on samplers over the years. Home is where the heart is. There is no place like it. I love my home with a ferocity totally out of proportion to its appearance or location. I love dumb things about it. The hot water heater, the plastic rack you, dry, you drain dishes in, the roof over my head, which occasionally leaks, and yet it is precisely those dumb things that make it what it is. A place of certainty, stability, predictability, privacy, for me and for my family. It is where I live. What more can you say about a place than that? That is everything. Yet, it is something that we've been edging away from gradually during my lifetime and the lifetimes of my parents and grandparents. There was a time when where you lived often was where you worked and where you grew the food you ate and even where you were buried. When that era passed, where you lived at least was where your parents had lived and where you would live with your children when you became enfeebled. Then, suddenly, where you lived was where you lived for three years until you could move on to something else and something else again. And so we have come to something else again, to children who do not understand what it means to go to their rooms because they have never had a room. 
to men and women whose fantasy is a wall they can paint a color of their own choosing, to old people reduced to sitting on molded plastic chairs, their skin blue-white in the lights of a bus station, who pull pictures of houses out of their bags. Homes have stopped becoming homes. Now they're real estate. The author points out the importance of having a home for a person's emotional well-being and sense of comfort. People find it curious that those without homes would rather sleep sitting up on benches or huddled in doorways than go to shelters. Certainly, some prefer to do so because they are emotionally ill, because they've been locked in before and they're damned if, they'll, if they will be locked in again. Others are afraid of the violence and trouble they may find there. But some seem to want something that is not available in shelters, and they will not compromise. Not for a cot, or oatmeal, or a shower with special soap that kills the bugs. One room, a woman with a baby who was sleeping on her sister's floor, once told me, painted blue. That was the crux of it. Not size or location, but pride of ownership. Painted blue. This is a difficult problem, and some wise and compassionate people are working hard at it. But in the main, I think we work around it, just as we walk around it when it is lying on the sidewalk or sitting in the bus terminal. The problem, that is. It has been customary to take people's pain and lessen our own participation in it by turning it into an issue, not a collection of human beings. We turn an adjective into a noun, the poor, not poor people, the homeless, not Anne or the man who lives in the box or the woman who sleeps on the subway grate. Sometimes I think we would be better off if we forgot about the broad strokes and concentrated on the details. Here is a woman without a bureau. There's a man with no mirror, no wall to hang it on. They are not the homeless. They are people who have no homes, no drawer that holds the spoons, no window to look out upon the world. My God, that is everything. In other words, the author ends the essay by pointing out the needs of several homeless people. She emphasizes homeless people as individuals and the importance of having a place to call home, something readers may take for granted.